helpful recommendations which were uh, helpful to us in taking many of our initiatives forward. So we welcome uh, our CEO and Joint Secretary OIA1, Sri Anurag Bhushan. Uh, welcome to the moderator for today's discussion, Professor Rupa Chanda. Our esteemed panelists for today's discussion, uh, Dr. Rajiv Das Gupta, Dr. Ibadat Dhillan, uh, Dr. Srinivas Rao, Ashish Jain, and Dr. Ayona Bhattacharji. Welcome to all of you. Healthcare is a sector that continues to be in high demand across the world, especially with the pandemic and prevalence of chronic diseases. And there is a demand not just for healthcare professionals uh, comprising of core workers such as doctors and nurses, but also allied care professionals. So to discuss the mobility aspects, various issues and challenges that can facilitate mobility in this sector, we have organized today's discussion. And we will look forward to today's discussion so that uh, we can brainstorm and gather new ideas. But before we do that, uh, I will request our CEO and Joint Secretary OIA1, Sri Anurag Bhushan, to give the opening remarks, please. Uh, thank you, Surbiji. Uh, first of all, um, uh, good evening to, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, this is our first meeting. I barely joined about a week uh, or so. So I'm pretty new to this assignment, but uh, I'm very excited. There are a lot of challenges. It's one of the uh, very important uh, developmental issues in India. And I'm so happy to, to be able to work with all of you to see that we make uh, movements on this issue. Uh, so uh, starting with this, uh, let me start my opening remarks. I am delighted to address this uh, panel discussion on pandemic health needs and supply demand dynamics. I thank all the participants and distinguished panelists for joining us for a yet another important discussion being organized by ICM. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, ICM has organized a series of virtual panel discussions on various themes relating to this important issue of international migration. Uh, healthcare has emerged a very important issue. And uh, we had held a panel discussion on mapping India's need versus foreign demand, a case of health care sector. The key issue during the, that panel discussion was addressing the increase in demand supply gap of healthcare workers while keeping the mind, while keeping in mind the need to meet India's domestic demands. Various aspects such as trends in outward migration of healthcare professionals from India recruitment practices across the healthcare sector, as well as the feasibility of bilateral agreements or partnerships in building opportunities for our health workers were discussed. Taking forward those deliberations, today we have come together to engage with the experts from various fields related to the health sector in order to understand their views and gain more insights about global best practices. Uh, how do we facilitate and improve the mobility of health professionals from India? It has had a significant impact on most of our established practices, norms, and legislations, and has emerged as the biggest challenge to deal with. The infection rates have ebbed and flowed, but what has been the constant is the need for a robust healthcare support. Aging population, care for elderly, rising number of chronic disease illnesses, and now the pandemic. They all indicate that the, there are opportunities in healthcare sectors that are as yet unmet and untapped. And we must ensure that this advantage accrues to India. According to WHO, this shortage is expected to be 18 million by 2030. There's not only a need for doctors and nurses, but also caregivers for geriatrics, long-term care, palliative care specialists, and in general, all professionals working in health and social care. The need for healthcare professional has been emphasized in policy initiatives in several countries. Many of the barriers that were earlier restricting the movement of migrants in this year's sector are being progressively relaxed with easier access to work in those countries. We have seen recently Belgium, Germany, Ireland, and Luxembourg they have decided to expedite current applications for recognition of foreign qualifications 
of healthcare professionals. Australia has increased the number of uh, working hours permitted for international nursing students. India thus stands to benefit from these obvious shifts in policy environment. And this is demonstrated by the fact that many healthcare, many countries around the world are welcoming healthcare workers, um, especially in English speaking nations and GCC, but also in non speaking countries such as Japan. Indian healthcare workers employed in other countries, particularly the GCC countries, were left stranded due to travel bans on flights. In 2020, amid healthcare shortages in the UAE, India facilitated the return of health professionals employed in their health facilities. <coughs> Excuse me. Healthcare workers make up a sizable share of skilled migration from India. And so we are keen on continuing this tradition of the mobility. We have the largest number of medical colleges, one of the highest number of highly qualified health professionals passing out every year. <coughs> Currently, there are around 562 medical colleges and 5162 nursing institutions spread across the country. We have an annual intake capacity of over 86,000 Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, <coughs> 42,000 postgraduate students, and 3.3 lakhs for nursing care. The linguistic competency of Indian healthcare professionals is an added advantage. We have also invested in increasing the capacity of our health personnel to satisfy our own as well as global demand. Under, under various initiatives, multiple AIMS institutes have been announced um, across the country. There are 22 currently. Uh, there are many other um, district referral hospitals that are being converted to medical school. There are 157 new government medical institutions that are planned to be added above above and beyond these numbers. The government of India, in fact, is now committed to expand about 2.5% of its GDP uh, on health, public health care spending. Thus, we are looking to tap into new or emerging countries as they face shortages. We have already signed an uh, uh, MOC with the government of Japan with regards to promoting the movement of skilled workers from India to Japan. Nursing care is one of the 14 specified sector, in fact, one of the most important sector and promising sector under the specified skilled worker scheme, also called SSW, where Indian health workers will be permitted to work in Japan on employment, full-time employment basis. Further, the Southeast Asia region also holds a lot of promise Singapore has projected a demand of 91,000 healthcare workers in 2030, of which 28,000 are projected to be foreign uh, nationals. Uh, this also provides a good opportunity. At the end, I would only like to stress that we at the MEA are constantly making efforts to address issues and obstacles pertaining to migration and mobility and ensuring that the recruitment process is fair the qualifications are recognized as widely as possible. That professional, uh, that addition of skills to professional moving about remains a key priority. And in this, healthcare remains a very important segment. As we are currently in the midst of uh, another wave of pandemic, this panel discussion is very timely. And I do hope that uh, the uh, discussions that will emanate post my address will contribute to setting up a roadmap in this very important sector. Thank you very much. I, once again, I'd like to welcome all of you to this panel discussion. And we, I hope that uh, discussions will lead to productive and interesting insights. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for those opening remarks and laying the groundwork for today's discussion. I would now move on to the core panel uh, and introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Professor Rupa Chanda. Uh, Professor Chanda is the RBI Chair Professor of Economics at IIM Bangalore. She is currently serving as the Director of Trade and Investment Innovation at UNESCO Bangkok. She has earlier worked as an economist at IMF and briefly served as the head of UNESCAP sub-regional office for South and Southwest Asia. Um, 
She has written extensively on WTO, international trade and services, regional integration, and has uh, constantly, her articles and books have constantly appeared uh, in various reputed journals. She is active professionally as a research guide, reviewer, and member of expert committee. And she was also a member of WTO, WHO's, I'm sorry, review committee on the functioning of the international health regulations in 2015 and 16 and to WHO's expert advisory group on international recruitment of health personnel in 2019-20. So I would now urge Rupa to take forward today's discussions. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Surupi. Um, a very warm welcome to everybody. Greetings. It's, it's a new year, though we are well into January. Uh, so I think this is an extremely timely discussion um, on health sector mobility from India and what India's contribution could be in creating a global health workforce. Um, we have already set the context, but let me just say a few words. Of course, we know that the demand for healthcare workers has been growing in uh, the last few decades, and a variety of factors have contributed to this. Uh, you have demography, of course, aging and population growth. You have growing awareness about the need for healthcare fueled by affluence. Uh, you have technological advancements and so on. And this demand supply imbalance that has been growing, uh, we have seen in uh, this pandemic itself how critical the health workforce is, both in terms of attending to those affected by the virus and also in preparing against future waves of infection. Um, also, one of the things that's not recognized enough and that was highlighted by Mr. Bhushan is that this is not just about nurses, though that tends to take up most of the discussion about you know, health workforce migration and shortages, but there's a whole spectrum of health workers, uh, caregivers, geriatric care, allied health workers, pharmacists, technicians, and so on. So really there is this huge need to understand what the landscape is in terms of the demand and the supply and how countries need to prepare to take advantage of these opportunities, the source countries that is, and how they can also benefit. Because ultimately what we are looking for is a win-win type of situation between sending and receiving countries. So India being a very important supplier country in the world, obviously uh, can play an important role in contributing towards global health workforce availability. And in this context, a range of issues become important, which I'm sure the, that the panelists today will address. One is basically just first understanding what the demand and supply imbalances are. What are the demand patterns? What are the shifts that are happening in the global market? What are their drivers? And what are those opportunity segments in terms of specific markets or geographies and healthcare segments? The second is to see what kind of preparedness, what kind of skilling and capacity building initiatives would be required in the domestic market? How do we better need to prepare our health workforce? This could be in terms of aligning with international standards, facilitating the recognition of qualifications. A third thing is about how do you regulate and manage these flows? How do you handle the intermediaries involved in this process? How do you make the health workforce flows much more gender sensitive, much more human rights sensitive. Another aspect is to look at bilateral arrangements because we know that there are major corridors and pathways of this migration. And then once we identify the particular markets, one might want to enter into specific agreements. Mr. Bhushan talked about that. So again, how do we negotiate these agreements? What are the features we need to incorporate to make them again a win-win for both the sending and the receiving countries? So today's panel discussion is really placed against the backdrop of all these issues. Um, and I am looking forward to this discussion. I'm sure our panelists will provide from the Indian perspective what these opportunities are, what kind of policy framework and initiatives we need domestically to prepare ourselves better to tap these opportunities and what sort of migration strategies we could employ going ahead. What does the pandemic teach us in particular? And does it change the way in which we do things or it really intensifies the need to address this issue? So with that, uh, let me not take up more time. Let me uh, introduce uh, our first speaker. So each speaker will get 10 minutes to speak uh, and I will be strict on time. So around 
eight minutes, if you could start winding up your intervention, that would be good. That would leave time at the end uh, for about 20 minutes of discussion with participants, questions from the floor. So let me begin. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Rajiv Das Gupta. He served a decade, 1993 to 2003, with the Epidemiology Division of the Municipal Corporation of Delhi and joined JNU in 2003, where he is currently professor and chairperson at the Center of Social Medicine and Community Health. He was Fulbright's senior research fellow and visiting associate professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and visiting professor at University of Technology, Sydney. He is closely engaged with ICMR, the National Certification Committee for Polio Eradication and the National Health Mission, as well as several other key national health programs and evaluations. He has widely published. Uh, he was managing editor of the Indian Journal of Community Medicine, and he's currently the managing editor of the Indian Journal of Public Health. So, Mr. Dr. Das Gupta, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Um, and I hope the slides are visible. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, once again, thanks to the Ministry of External Affairs and the Center for Migration for the invitation. I was uh, frankly uh, quite surprised and overwhelmed. I'll I'll try my best to to set the tone for this panel. Uh, and uh, I have titled it as uh, Human Resources for Health, HIH Migration, and UHC, Universal Healthcare, Confronting the Conundrum. Uh, and essentially what I would uh, seek to, to put on the table are two, if somewhat conflicting uh, perspectives, a more productionist perspective uh, from, from the point of view of the Ministry of External Affairs of uh, producing much larger number of skilled uh, workforce in this particular sector and be able to facilitate uh, their movement globally, as, uh, as was set out in the uh, opening address. And on the other hand, we have, uh, we have the challenges of meeting the universal health coverage, uh, which is, which is our, uh, our, our goal from the, from the health sector. And therefore, how do we, how do we really see this? Uh, mobility, the quality or state of being mobile or movable and the ability or capacity to move that's what this this uh, one one perspective is and certainly global labor mobility is increasingly a key priority for economic uh, diplomacy and therefore understandably being uh, promoted as as one of the key uh, key uh, focus areas of the ministry of external affairs in this uh, pandemic context there are three or four uh, parameters that, that mark the evolving landscape. One is that modes of global production are changing. There's a dematerialization of sorts, and there's a whole range of virtual migration. So all migration, particularly of skilled forces, skilled workforce may not necessarily be a physical uh, migration. That, that possibility also needs to be kept in mind. Uh, though healthcare per se is extremely uh, labor and human resource intensive. And uh, second, overall, there has been a pandemic induced digital acceleration, which has its bearing on, on uh, communications, education, and so on. And while the pandemic can also be seen as a shock to go global migration, imposing some restrictions against global movement of labor, uh, certainly resulting in the short term in remittance flows uh, estimated by the World Bank to be as, as high as 23% in uh, fiscal year 2020, year on year. And on the other hand, in the social and cultural realms, there is increasing xenophobia, protectionism and virus blamed on migrants. And this is not just global, but uh, to, to some uh, extent, uh, to some extent uh, uh, internal to the country too. And therefore, in this setting, what really are the chances and implications of restructuring HRH? Now, in general, as we all know and appreciate that healthcare and care work in general are likely to experience higher demand. Uh, there's a vast volume of emerging discourse on transnational health framework that's inclusive of migrants. This is looking at it from the point of view of migrant health. And some of the Gulf countries are 
expanding access to free health care for migrant labor. So that in itself uh, is a driver for increasing uh, increasing uh, provision of, of health care workers and therefore potential for, for, uh, for migration needs. Also that migration, migrant workers form a critical chunk of uh, essential services and that's equally true of health care and care work. And therefore that entails a whole whole range of reorientation of student mobility, of mutual recognition of degrees, and, and a huge, uh, huge set of uh, imperatives for the education field. Uh, and and that's, that's equally true, that that's equally uh, relevant for India uh, and certainly the potential in India to, to provide education for a global health workforce. And again, uh, simultaneously, the, the emergence and growth uh, of the of the edutech center uh, sorry uh, sector is also relevant so these are these are various forces that are complexly intertwined with each other and uh, and and we need to understand uh, and uh, that in 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 in, a, in in the totality of things so that's that's on one hand the 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 global scenario uh, the, the 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 shifts in some of the uh, landscape and forces in the pandemic setting and on the other hand, we have the SDG target of 3.8 of achieving universal health coverage. Uh, so EHC is defined by the WHO as all individuals and communities receiving the health services they need uh, without suffering financial hardship. And this includes the full, full spectrum of, of health services, which you can understand makes an immense demand uh, on on the on numbers and skills of of uh, human resources in health and the subtext of this is that adequate and competent health and care workers at facility outreach and community levels are absolutely crucial equally crucial are issues of equitable distribution uh, and that they're adequately supported and enjoy decent work i'm sure uh, the who speaker will dwell further on these values and that, that the WHO promotes both globally as well as regionally and in country. Uh, what really are the existing systemic deficits in the HRE system? The next few slides are drawn from uh, the high level expert group, the HLEG as it's popularly referred to as, uh, which, was, which was meant to, to, to provide inputs to restructuring uh, the ongoing reforms in the health services. Uh, and uh, this this comes around 2010-11, their work, and, and that's quite instructive. So uh, pointing to flagging the existing systemic deficits in the HRH system in the country, one is lack of data, and we shall see some examples of this. Skewed production of human resources, so six high HRH production states uh, that you can see has anything between 50 to 60 percent of MBBS and nursing seats. These are largely the the southern and western states, and eight, eight low HRH production uh, states, which are which are largely of the uh, of the uh, countries uh, in the heartland, if I may, uh, most of the central Indian states with large population but relatively low uh, production. Uh, of I'm sorry, uh, but the slides are not moving. Uh, we're still stuck on slide one. So. Really. Is this, be is this better now? I mean, visible now? Yes, uh, Rajiv. It's, uh, it's uh, moving it, now. It's moving they now. Are moving now. They if are moving now. They are moving now. Okay, if thanks. Can, if you can do the slideshow, it will be... It is in slideshow. It is in slideshow. Is it okay? Uh, Chair, should I continue? Yes, yes. Okay. Please. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, we are running out of time also, so it yeah. may be And better. finally, the issues of human resource deployment and distribution. So the HLEG projections are important. So the global norm uh, pitching at 23 workers per 10,000 population, what they've essentially done is a projection between 2011 for the next 10 years. And if we are to, uh, to, to have this uh, projected density, by 2022 where we are now actually what kind of uh, what are the options available in terms of increasing the production of human resources and the kind of investments that it would need so this is to flag these uh, issues these are available in the full report now the current strategies uh, 
the, the Global Health Workforce Alliance and WHO categorizing India among the most severe crisis facing countries in terms of availability of HRH. And therefore, this is an investment case. Is, are the slides moving? Actually, no. No, they are not. I, I think I should just stick to uh, stick to the basic format. Okay, so this is the projected uh, HRH density and and uh, what it would mean for the country to augment this. This is from the HLEG report. Is it moving now? Yes. Okay, and uh, among the current strategies. Uh, the, 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 that, that there's an investment case for HRH in India. And the three recent strategies of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare are to establish new institutions to produce health workers, to expand in, intake capacities and upgrade existing district hospitals to medical colleges. So the, this slide is important because it draws data from two sources, the National Health uh, Workforce Accounting and the NSSO. And what it shows is that when you actually go for uh, go for uh, uh, confirming the qualification, that even the numbers that are reported actually turn out to be less. And therefore, the all health worker is currently roughly at about uh, 35 uh, per 10,000 population. And therefore, this data uh, is, is, is a really uh, critical uh, issue in understanding the health professional situation in the country. And in terms of density, this is the disparity across states, predictably with Kerala at the top and some of the largest states, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Odisha, Bihar, right at the bottom. And you can see the extent of disparity. So in the aggregate, it's a one picture. But when we look at disparity across states and then when we keep the UHC goal in mind, this is a far, far more daunting task. Uh, and one final thing, considering migration, what really is the age and gender distribution uh, of the current health workers? It may be a bit small. For some professions, uh, understandably so, nurses, uh, frontline health workers, the female, which is the saffron band, is a much larger band, and therefore that can have uh, sociocultural uh, bearings on, on migration or promoting migration. And looking at it at in terms of the age bands, from left to right, it is lower ages to higher ages. So this, this is roughly the middle, which is the age group of 30 to 50. Uh, the blue is below 30. This, this really is the, the age distribution of currently available uh, health workforce in the country. This is drawn from a, a paper uh, by uh, PHFI and partners from the WHO. So that's that's the data source. This is the most re one of the most recent analysis that's available. And finally, my last two uh, slides, moving towards a comprehensive HRH labor market framework. This draws from the WHO's framework, uh, cautioning us to, to, to balance uh, the, 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 the skewedness between supply capacity and market-based demand, uh, and the need to attain necessary quantity, quality, and relevance of the health workforce that will require policy and funding decisions on both education and labor market. And finally, the need to have uh, an, an integrated approach uh, for balancing population and health system needs, adjusting investment volumes and educational policies to redress prevalent labor market failures in terms of shortages, malnutrition, uh, maldistribution, sorry, and unemployment of health workers. And we have seen the maldistribution across states uh, align market forces and population expectations, again with primary healthcare needs and universal access at its center. And finally, orient curricula balancing the pressure to train for international markets and local health needs. Uh, thank you. And sorry for the for the slight uh, malfunctioning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and for putting in that word of caution that as we look at the possibilities for out migration, we must remain cognizant of the huge disparities within the country across states and also some of the characteristics of our health workforce. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Srinivas Rao Pulijala. He's the CEO of Apollo Med Skills Limited. He's a postgraduate in medicine, member of the Royal College of General Practitioners, member of the American College of Physicians, 
and has had continuing education in emergency medicine and diabetes. He's a management graduate from the Indian School of Business, Hyderabad. He has also co-authored a lot of books on hospital management and health informatics. So the floor is yours. Uh, you're on mute. I think we can't hear you. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, I'll just take uh, four or five slides through. Today, I'm going to share some experiences of our training and recruitment for international markets. Uh, so we are an India International Skill Center uh, partnered with National Skill Development Corporation. So present in over 32, 32 centers over 24 states in India. So. Our experience in last two years for UK and Ireland, we have successfully placed 109 nurses last year, and we intend to scale it to 130 by another 130 nurses would be who have cleared their English language and as well as the clinical requirements to reach UK and Ireland uh, by end of March 2022. So totally about 239 nurses this year we have trained and placing them in UK. We have also placed 86 doctors in last two years, predominantly two specializations. One is emergency physicians and second is radiologists. So these are the two specializations and we have, we are the actually authorized exam centers for the Royal College of Radiologists and also the Royal College of Emergency Physicians. So Apollo Hospital is an authorized uh, as training and assessment center for these two colleges. So uh, we train close to 400. Uh, each year in emergency medicine and uh, the radiology. Radiology training has just begun last year. And uh, out of this, about 86 doctors have been placed. So the remaining 300 uh, doctors remained in India, uh, but 86 doctors have gone to UK. Uh, we also have strong relations in, uh, we have partnerships with Middle East and uh, we have placed close to 536 nurses in the last two years in Dubai and 236 nurses were sent in a special flight in June 2021 for COVID support. Um, so these are the uh, placement record, international placement record for the last two years. Uh, there are certainly some challenges and uh, some opportunities. The challenges are particularly on the recognition of degree side, degrees in allied health and support work as well. Well, there is a cross recognition of Indian medicine and Indian nursing, though we have to clear some medical clinical licensing exams and uh, the doctors and nurses are supposed to clear the language requirements. But for allied health and support workers, for the medical lab technicians, for the operation theater technicians, for the radiology technicians, the dialysis technicians who are also in very high demand, but our degrees are not cross recognized. So there is almost a very, uh, I, I would say, nil migration of allied health and support workers to particularly to Europe and US. The language skills are one of the big challenges. We have found that success rate on IELTS uh, is less than 20% uh, because the nurses are expected to clear the English language requirements at band seven for UK uh, and for most of the countries in Europe. And even the German language requirement is at a B2 level, which is a, a kind of a near advanced level of language. So the language skills are challenging because we come from a multilingual culture as a nation. So uh, it takes the nurses take a lot of difficulty to qualify for these exams and the reference checks. This is a unique challenge from existing and previous employers. So the hospitals discourage uh, attrition. So uh, they don't give these experience certificates and sometimes there's a delay in reference checks that also would delay the migration of healthcare professionals. In the last two years, because of pandemic, because of reduced or restricted mobility of flights uh, and cancellation of flights, it was also one of the reasons for difficulty in migration. Now the 130 students, nurses who have cleared their language requirements, uh, we couldn't send most of them to UK because of this restriction. What are the opportunities? There is an increasing demand for nurses globally and UK has opened up, uh, NHS UK has opened up a requirement for about 50,000 plus nurses by 2025. That's a humongous number. Um, I think India would be one of the largest suppliers. And today I think globally 22% of 
healthcare resources are Indian. So we have traditionally been one of the largest suppliers of human resources in healthcare. The governments of Ireland, Germany, Japan, Denmark, Luxembourg, as um, Mr. Anurag has mentioned earlier, are looking for overseas nurses, uh, both for geriatric care and also for their clinical services. In the allied health and support worker space, there is a ri rising demand for geriatric aids, radiographers, and lab technicians. So geriatric aids now, I think few countries like Japan, Germany, and few other European countries have also opened up these opportunities. I think we need to prepare ourselves with the one of the solution that I foresee is with the formation of the allied health, because allied health bill has been passed in the parliament in both the houses uh, early last year. So that could help in cross recognition of degrees and that could help aid in faster mobilization. So currently we have international training centers in Delhi, Kochi uh, and Hyderabad. And we are also planning to expand our training centers uh, uh, in India. We also have strong networks in NHS trust hospitals for our trainings because there is a OSCE training. So there are 11 partner hospitals in UK. We have our office in UK as well. So 11 partner hospitals in UK uh, will act as training grounds for our OSCE training where they employ our nurses. So that's it. These are some of the thoughts and experiences that I wanted to share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pulijala. And uh, our next speaker is Dr. Ibadat Thilan. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, actually, I went by an earlier program agenda, and so uh, you were the next speaker, so I apologize for the confusion. Um, so, well, it's nice to see Dr. Ibadat Thilan because uh, we met in the context of other panels. So he's currently the regional advisor, human resources for health for the WHO Southeast Asia region office. His work is focused on human resources for health and health systems at the national and global levels. He previously served at the WHO headquarters in the health workforce department, and he led work on health worker migration. He has also previously served as health advisor for the Danish government, the Irish government, the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and for the Aspen Institute. So we look forward to hearing you, Badat. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rupa. And uh, you know, it really is a privilege to uh, present in front of this audience. If people from WHO, we don't generally get to speak to uh, colleagues in migration and external affairs. And maybe this is one of the most uh, important point that uh, is going to come from my presentation. And I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Dr. Dilip from the WHO country office, from the country office, uh, who actively supports on HRH at the union level and at the states, and then my on my behalf uh, from more of the regional and global perspective. And I think it follows very nicely with what Dr. Das and Dr. Rao said, and the need to find this balance. And and I think one of the things I want to emphasize is how especially at uh, in the migration field and in external affairs and why maybe the health sector should be seen perhaps differently uh, than other skill sectors i think i won't spend too much time on this but i think really this is at the heart of our issue that we're discussing is that how do we reconcile these many different uh, goals that we have linked to the health workforce and the production of the health workforce um, for who uh, the need uh, domestically in India for health workers is something that also requires a lot of attention that oftentimes doesn't get the attention in the, uh, the field or of migration. So thank you for the organizers for actually bringing this perspective forward. This issue is a complex issue. It keeps coming back over and over again. It's an issue that has been there from the 70s where many developing countries were concerned that uh, uh, that uh, low-skilled uh, workers were being kept out of foreign markets while high-skilled uh, workers were being uh, taken. Uh, and so that's the, the term brain drain uh, and its use in the, in the United Nations documents. Uh, and yet this issue keeps coming back over and over again. And uh, in the early 2000s, again, linked to a lot of movement of uh, uh, illegal migrants across the Mediterranean, uh, this was Professor, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati in the Financial Times who identified the two big issues in migration. 
was the illegal unskilled migration migrants going into rich countries and the brain drain of skilled citizens from the poorest countries and that these issues had highlighted a gaping hole in the international institutional architecture uh, to manage these issues with so many different uh, sectors and entities uh, engaging. About 20 years later again with COVID-19, and this came up very strongly at the World Health Assembly last year, there was a big discussion on the assembly on, on this increased need linked to COVID-19 and what some described as a global scramble for health workers, given the intensifying need and demand, and in some ways a race to the bottom, where uh, actually the poorest countries are the ones that perhaps uh, have the hard biggest challenge to retain their own health workers. Well, before I also think that as we speak to this context, it's it's important to get both the regional context and uh, very quickly the India context. Um, I think it's important to remember that in the Southeast Asia region, it's a home to almost a quarter of the world's population. Uh, we have some of the highest rates of extreme poverty in the region, the highest out of pocket expenditure on health and the lowest public spending on health of any WHO region. Uh, the populations are still growing in this region, NCDs are rising, urbanization is increasing, we see climate change and <clears throat> emergencies such as COVID-19. Uh, India, as you know, is, is the country with the second most infections from COVID. Um, across the region, economies have contracted, uh, progress on, uh, on poverty allevi alleviation has reversed, service delivery has reversed, and the health system needs and associated financing has increased at the same time. Um, just in terms of poverty, uh, the World Bank estimated that of the 120 million people who were pushed into extreme poverty uh, in 2020, 60% resided in South Asia. So just to give a sense of the scale. And the availability of doctors, nurses and midwives in uh, the region is still a quarter of that of America's in the Europe, uh, the areas that we're still trying to keep the demand for. And uh, the production of doctors and nurses in the region is still less than half of the OECD averaged. And uh, even though many of the countries of the region are seen as major global suppliers of health workers, the production is still vastly below other countries, rich countries. Um, India I won't go into the detail. I think uh, uh, Dr. Das went through it and uh, uh, Dr. Dalip can give much more details on these. But really, you know, if you look at the density of doctors, nurses, midwives, it's far below the global threshold that WHO established in 2016 to achieve universal health coverage, which is 44.5 per 10,000 population. Um, but it is, uh, and the global median is around 48. So to give you a sense that just of doctors, uh, nurses and midwives in India, it's about one third of the global median of the density of doctors, nurses and midwives. If we put all our health professionals in together, it's still far short, short of this number. And we've already seen the issue around the, the distribution uh, challenges in India. Production, we have seen significant growth across occupations. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Das mentioned, a disparity in production across states. Uh, and production that is still significantly, significantly below the required need and below OECD averages. Uh, quality is a major issue, and we can go into more detail later if needed. And there have been significant reforms to address both production and quality, including the National Medical Commission and now the Allied Health Worker uh, Act. And because of all these challenges, I think we can't forget, right now we're in the Omicron wave, and how much the country has had to adapt and uh, uh, use different strategies to meet these very significant gaps in health workforce, including uh, utilizing students and for temporary deployment, using retired and volunteer health workers, mobilization of staff for non-medical support, use of telemedicine. So I think we cannot forget this equity issue of um, domestically trying to rely on more and more on non-skilled workers or on uh, junior professionals while we're trying to export our skilled workers overseas. So this is something that somehow we have to find balance. Um, this is, I think, data many of you will be aware of from the OECD. The demand in OECD countries continues to uh, increase. The 
Reliance on foreign trained doctors and nurses continues to increase. India is the leading source country for medical doctors uh, for OECD countries. And it is the second leading uh, uh, country, country for nurses and uh, with Philippines being the first. But uh, as I will point to a little bit later, uh, India will very quickly become the first most likely. Next slide, I won't go into these details, sorry. But simply, I think we mentioned some of these issues that even before COVID-19, we could see that the European Union was looking to uh, include, to add an additional 1.8 million health sector jobs by 2025. Germany, 500,000 health workers shortages by 2030. Japan, Norway, and the UK, as we heard, where, where, there was, where there's a current government commitment to increase uh, uh, staffing in the NHS by 50,000 uh, nurses in the near term by 2025. And then we had COVID-19. So those were all estimates before COVID-19. And because of COVID-19, we can see even more pressure on the health workforce across countries, uh, increased health workforce demand and need. And as we heard in the opening statement, we've seen that unlike other areas, we've seen exemptions to entry bans, licensure flexibilities, expedited visa processes, uh, qualification recognition, et cetera, and recruitment uh, funds and recruitment drives internationally. At the same time, in some countries, there was a real concern of the loss of health workers during this period. So we saw countries put in place restrictions on exit permits and restrictions in giving certificates of good standing. Uh, some countries recalled overseas students to help with the issue domestically. There were public appeals for return from countries, for example, like Ireland, that were looking to meet their own staffing needs. And there was direct concerns raised to WHO and very recently to the UN, uh, especially around some of this inequity where the, the provision of education is from the public purse. Uh, one example I definitely wanted to give at this meeting was that of the Philippines. And uh, the Philippines in 2020 put forward two resolutions through its overseas employment agency where the Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of Health and the overseas uh, employment agency came together. Uh, they identified that there were domestic shortages of health workers, that annual migration aggravated shortages, and really that there was a mission critical need to address COVID-19. So as part of an early resolution, they imposed a moratorium on overseas deployment of really nursing uh, cutters, uh, what they called mission critical skills. So this was put in place, it was quite an extreme position. And then over time, uh, at the end of December 2020, the three, the Overseas Employment Agency came together and lifted the moratorium, but it has established since an annual deployment ceiling of 5,000 health workers disaggregated by occupation. So previously, uh, Philippines was exporting 13,000 plus health workers, and now they put a cap on 5,000 health workers but really stressing the, the stress that the system is feeling domestically uh, to address the COVID-19 pandemic. This is also, I wanted to show this data because as we're talking about numbers, we can, this is very recent data by our colleague, Dr. Jim Buchan, who published this on the new registrants to the UK uh, in the Na Nursing and Midwifery Council. And you can see that uh, if you look at the new registrants into the council, that it is the main producer for the UK is England. But the second one, even before the schools from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is India. So India in, uh, two th in, uh, uh, in September to March, in just that six month period, uh, there were about 2000 uh, plus nurses that went in registered in the UK. And uh, since then there've been another 4000 plus. So just to give you a sense of the magnitude of movement that is already taking place uh, for off Indian trained nurses into the United Kingdom. And I think it was really on many of these factors, I won't go into the detail, I know I'm running out of time, that in the health sector, we came up with the WHO Global Code of Practice to balance these interests around the freedom of movement, but also the need to look at the health system interests in these discussions. Um, I won't go into the dis dis uh, details on the code, or on this health workforce support and safeguards list. But really that in the recent 
especially in this last year, we've seen many important uh, policy developments, um, especially in the UK and Germany. Uh, UK and Germany both, which had committed to not do private recruitment from countries on WHO's list, are now actively doing private recruitment through India, as India is no longer on the list. Um, moreover, the UK code of practice has been revised to very much align with the WHO global code of practice. And I think perhaps the most important point from this instrument is that this new revision of UK's recruitment policy happened with through a cross Whitehall process where the Department of Trade, the Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of Home Affairs, the NHS, Health Education England, and the governments of Scotland, Ireland, and Wales came together with the Department of Health as chair to look at what would be their policy for international recruitment of health workers. And they emphasized in it that they wanted to make sure that there was no negative impact on source country health system. And they were looking to support uh, mechanisms of collaboration and mutual benefit. And they go as far as saying whether through direct reimbursement, exchange of skills, knowledges and processes, etc. Uh, and then the EU, through its EU migration pact, is similarly looking at the health sector and similarly trying to find an approach that will benefit all countries. I mean, that, that will benefit the, the, the sector itself. And I think this is an area that really uh, where leadership uh, from uh, MEA and others could really help drive uh, uh, some of these win-win solutions that we're trying to get towards. Um, so finally, I think just a few concluding points. Uh, India is a, a leading global supplier of health workers, yet the pronounced need, yet they're pronounced needs domestically and the production is significantly lower than that of OECD countries that it's supplying to. Uh, health worker migration is an increasing priority for development, education, health, foreign affairs, labor, and trade stakeholders. Yet health stakeholders and goals are often underrepresented <coughs> in the dialogue and especially in the development of government to government agreements, um, especially, okay, I'll come back to later. And prima facie, you know, the recent high income policies identify opportunities to advance long term and mutual cooperation that addresses both the overseas and domestic health needs. Um, but really, these have not been taken advantage of yet. Um, it's an, an opportunity to conclude uh, agreements in a new way, in a, in a way that actually looks at the domestic health system need. And I think we should remember that as we are looking for these cooperation agreements, that the interlocutor on the other side is usually a Ministry of Health, a public institution that is looking to hire these health workers. So there really is an opportunity to strengthen government-to-government uh, -government cooperation. And uh, as mentioned earlier, there's a need to strengthen data on health workforce availability and on migration, and, and the MEA could play, a, and ICM could play an important role in this. Um, there's a need to include health system priorities and stakeholders in dialogue and agreements that take place in the area. They're happening in many other areas and other countries are successfully doing, uh, doing this, bringing different stakeholders together. And uh, finally, uh, you know, oftentimes, whether it's Germany or UK, there's a national framework for international recruitment where they have already balanced their interest across different stakeholders. And then they implement that policy and they move to countries uh, based on the different, uh, you know, so they move based on their own policy. And uh, the, maybe there's an opportunity to develop a national framework that brings together the interests, of the all the various interests internally within India that could then allow it to have a stronger dialogue with its partner countries to move towards this mutual benefit. And it would also strengthen uh, the you know, cooperation with other countries, for example, like Philippines, that's that's doing similar work and leading this discussion with overseas, with similar source countries, both in the region and uh, internationally. So these were some initial thoughts. Uh, thank you. And sorry for being so fast. <laughs> thank you, um, Dr. Dhillan. So you've actually highlighted again the issue of bringing in the balance, uh, the trade-offs that might be involved in trying to encourage uh, outflows, the equity issue, a uh, lot of other important things, for instance, the need for bringing in a variety of stakeholders, cross-agency coordination, and looking at the mutual benefit aspect and trying to explore opportunities in terms of managed and bilateral agreements. The data issue is also very apt. Um, so 
Now let's move to our next uh, speaker uh, because we are, I think, a little bit behind time. Uh, Mr. Ashish Jain is our next speaker. He's the CEO of Healthcare Sector Skills Council, which aims to facilitate the creation of a robust and vibrant ecosystem to qualify for quality for quality vocational education and skill development in allied healthcare. He has completed his postgraduate diploma in business management and has gained work experience of over 20 years. Um, earlier, he was director at CII and at the CII headquarters, New Delhi. He has handled a variety of sectors there. So we look forward to hearing you, Mr. Jen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rupa. Uh, and I wanted to thank organizers for giving me this opportunity to be talking on this very important uh, subject. Uh, as we already heard from uh, you know various uh, speakers around saying the importance of the uh, the migration and you know the uh, in terms of what is the what is happening right now in terms of the current uh, you know the situation uh, you know what uh, caught my attention is you know in in the, in the in the topic is it says you know healthcare sector mobility from india and their contribution creating a global health workforce and when I look at the, you know, last, you know, uh, words, which is creating a global health workforce, which caught my attention actually in the entire topic here. And why this is so is because I could uh, recall, uh, you know, uh, some years back, our honorable prime minister spoke about uh, making India the skill capital of the world. And I think it fits very well into the uh, entire spectrum while the honorable prime minister spoke about making India the skill capital. And probably healthcare is one area which can actually make this happen very well for at least for healthcare sector, and that's what that's why it caught uh, you know attention of uh, in terms of uh, where we are and what we can do. Uh, I think um, many of the previous speakers have spoken about uh, you know need to look at different cadres of healthcare doctors, nurses, allied health, and the you know skilled workers as well. <clears throat> uh, but uh, as we could see you know during the various presentations made by the speakers. Uh, and I think this is one of the, the key issue also is this, we do not have enough data on, you know, the, the, uh, the cadres other than the, say, for example, doctors and nurses. We normally, when we speak about the migration or the healthcare workforce, we actually limit ourselves to uh, the, the number of doctors being produced in the country or number of nursing institutions we have in the country. But I think at the same time, uh, what uh, the, the, the country and the world is recognizing slowly and, you know, fast now, that there's an important cadre of allied health and the skilled health workforce, which actually go hand in hand with the uh, nurses and doctors to provide the healthcare services, be it whether you want to achieve our goal of universal health coverage, or we want to look at the uh, mobility of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the Indian workforce to global uh, country to globally to other countries. I think we need to focus on this cadre as well, which is uh, sometimes. Uh, you know, missing, you know, in terms of the terms of, and this is going to be the big cadre. Why we talk about the number of doctors being trained and, and very rightly pointed out, uh, you know, we spoke about brain drain in the certain, you know, few years back. And then we said, it's only the high skilled person, which are migrated from, uh, you know, the low income countries to the high income countries. I think India is at a very, uh, you know, poised at a very great juncture here where we can actually focus on, in addition to other healthcare work for, you know, cadres to, uh, these, uh, I would not say low skill, but the healthcare workforce, human resources, which can become a major, major, uh, you know, uh, major numbers for us to, you know, uh, have the globally, globally, global mobilization for these kind of workers. And this is going to be win-win for us as a country and for a world as well, because there is a large demand as already indicated uh, by the previous speakers, not only for the healthcare workforce, for doctors and nurses, but other areas as well. And this is where we as an India can play a major role in addition to what we are doing. And the advantage what we have is, uh, you know, the Indian healthcare workforce is well accepted across uh, across the globe. Uh, and I think the statistics have been already been shown by our previous speakers, uh, be it from the OECD countries and be it from the US and UKs. I think we Indian uh, Indian workforce in the healthcare is well accepted. So are the people who are coming from the allied health and uh, from the skilled health workers, which is which is well accepted as well, and as uh, we could see that uh, some of the countries are already easing out the uh, you know the visa regulations for Indian health workers to migrate to other countries. Uh, recently, we saw uh, that UK came out with a specific announcement uh, for allowing the caregivers from India to UK, 
uh, for a short term visa, which would be then extended probably to a five year term visa, which is expected to happen. Uh, we are in dialogue with some of the uh, UK counterparts here. We are looking to see how this can happen. So I think we need to focus, uh, you know, on this as well as we are focusing on the doctors and nurses. Uh, we had, we said, you know, we have the uh, we have the great ecosystem already built into the country now. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the so many medical colleges and so many nursing colleges across country. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have across country uh, the the ecosystem created for skill training now under the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. And I'm happy to see that uh, I could see uh, Sita is there from ILO, which uh, we worked along a paper with them, uh, you know, in terms of our putting this together in the capacity in the country in terms of, you know, providing a skilled labor. Similarly, I could see one of my uh, other friend Pukharaj, who's actually, you know, trained people in these areas and nurses, which are, you know, then sent across uh, the globe as well. So what, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we have enough capacity on ground in country today to train large workforce for healthcare from the healthcare sector, which can then be, you know, very well mobilized to the, uh, to the globe and to the countries where these people are required today. Uh, we can meet that requirement uh, well. We are very well, uh, you know, uh, we have good trainers, we have good training capacity, good training capabilities, and which is already demonstrated by some of the previous, you know, speakers that what we have, just to give you some numbers, you know. Uh, so if you look at the Healthcare Sector Skill Council today, we almost train and certify, you know, 50,000 plus healthcare workforce in the country on an annual basis. And while I'm speaking to you today, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship is running a scheme for COVID frontline workers, where we are training almost 100,000, you know, COVID frontline workers in a short time frame to see that we can actually meet the COVID challenge what we are facing. And I'm happy to share today that while we are speaking, so many of these people are being trained in the country are actually working in the hospital today, hand in hand with our, you know, trained nurses and doctors to provide the healthcare facilities as in the, you know, providing the necessary support, which is required. And these people are being able to, you know, do what they're able to do is they've been able to take away uh, some of the load from our nurses and doctors and, you know, so that they can divide more time towards more critical activities and see and, and, and can take, you know, some burden out of them as well. Uh, if, you, if I look at, uh, you know, the in terms of the capacity, which we can train as a country today, if you want to expand it, I think our capacity and some of my colleagues so who are working with us in the Ministry of Skill Development would agree that this capacity along with, if we put with the Ministry of Health uh, ecosystem in place, I think it's very, very easily uh, possible for us to, you know, train almost 100,000 healthcare workforce across country, uh, you know, to provide, which can be very, very useful for our country while we wanted to achieve uh, the UHC goals and actually in the for her mobilizing uh, for other, you know, the other, the other countries as well. Uh, I also wanted to mention here that, you know, we, some of the issues which are mentioned about is about the, you know, initial, I think uh, Dr. Rupa also mentioned about this uh, in terms of the, you know, the mapping of uh, the standards in different countries. Uh, what we have in our country and what uh, probably we have for other countries today. I think that's a major area which we need to work on. And I'm happy to share again that uh, we had already worked with 13 countries in this uh, aspect where we have mapped uh, the standards for uh, the Indian qualifications with their qualifications. And there's a G2G dialogue which is happening concurrently, uh, you know, to see how the recognition of this certification can happen in other countries. Of course, we all know that healthcare is a and highly regulated subject across globe, uh, so that may require uh, some uh, you know ongoing dis discussions, you know, thorough discussions with the other governments to see how uh, these certifications can be accepted or what you know how can this be eased up from you know other participants who are entering from other countries. So that discussion is ongoing right now. And I can, uh, you know, I was just looking at some of the names of the countries, which is already covered, but I could, I would like to name, say we have covered countries like Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, Sweden, UK, US, Netherlands, Switzerland, uh, New, Z uh, New Zealand, Qatar, KS, and Singapore. So these are some of the countries where we've already done mapping of the roles and where the, uh, the demand is coming in, you know, so for one of the, uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> the CEO also mentioned about uh, Mr. Bushin also mentioned about this demand why uh, the the MOU with the government of Japan and you know the subsequent MOUs uh, for uh, under the uh, you know the different schemes TTIT or the SSW schemes where 
Uh, the caregivers are required in Japan. Similarly, I think uh, there is a requirement which is coming up from now UK where the discussions are ongoing between the UK and the Indian government to see how the caregivers can be supplied to uh, UK as well. And this demand is not only limited to one country or you know a couple of countries because we do understand demographically. I think we are looking at the aging society, which means that we have we will see the rising demand, especially for the areas of geriatric care and the elderly care, which will be there uh, from our country as well, but largely from other countries. So I think that that's the focus, and that's where we see uh, some very good case examples where. People are trained in India and are working well in other countries now, and they are, you know, uh, the, the people, these trained, skilled people in other countries as well. Uh, I so what we see as in uh, you know, the entire spectrum is that we. My only last comment on this is that while we talk about the migration, while we talk about the numbers, I think we should equally give importance to. Uh, not only doctors and nurses to the other allied health and the skilled health workforce as well, because that's going to be important cadre, uh, and that's going to be very important for India if we had to, uh, you know, because we have enough youth in country which can be trained in these areas and can actually meet the requirement of the globe, which is required. And if you can do this, I think this will be win-win for India and for the world because the world requires such skilled and trained man for uh, workforce from the healthcare sector. And we have all those requisite now in the country to train these people, which can then be utilized optimally to see that all you know gets a win-win out of the entire situation. So I'll stop here. In case there are any questions, I'll be happy to take it later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're really behind time now. Uh, so our last speaker is Dr. Ayona Bhattacharji. She is currently an assistant professor of economics at the Inter International Management Institute in New Delhi. And prior to this, she was assistant professor at OP Jindal Global University. She has a doctoral degree in economics from IM Bangalore. And she has worked extensively on the healthcare sector, looking at trade and health issues, health worker mobility, technology adoption. She has also published extensively. So over to you. Thank you, Dr. Rupa Chinda. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, since we are running out of time, so I'll keep it very short. But thanks to everyone uh, who's present today and also to my co-panelists for such insightful uh, discussions. And of course, it's a privilege to be able to talk to this uh, talk at this particular forum. So uh, briefly, let me just uh, 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 come back to this uh, whole discussion where we are actually looking at and resonating with what the WHO had stated. That is, there can be no health without health workers. And we are all back to realizing and discussing that same old issue. So even before uh, the pandemic struck, we saw that there were discussions about how human uh, health resources or human resources for health were uh, running in crisis or were falling short of the required demand, especially not just in the uh, developing countries, but even in the developed countries. Now, what I'm going to talk about is more from an academic perspective, because so far we have, of course, been looking at issues from more uh, practical uh, uh, perspectives. So firstly, this is what was highlighted long back and right before the pandemic struck, that there's likely going to be a shortfall of 18 million health workers by 2030. 2030. And there are several push and pull factors which will probably help these countries overcome such shortages. So there would, of course, be migration of health workers across countries, be it from within South to South migration or from South to North migration. But interestingly, there are some studies which have shown that there are different reasons why these uh, health professionals move. There are reasons which are exclusively there for the nurses, which are not necessarily the same as the reasons which drive migration of general practitioners and specialist physicians and so on. And why I am mentioning this is also because it helps us in understanding what exactly contributes to these migration flows. And if we are able to actually identify those reasons, we can, we can come up with appropriate policies as well. Just a quick look at the data to understand the kind of uh, shares uh, held by the foreign trained doctors and nurses in different OECD countries, we see that these other countries such as Australia, Canada, Ireland, uh, Israel, all of these countries have usually reported very high shares of 
foreign trained doctors. Vis a vis when we look for the nurses, these have usually been Australia, Israel, New Zealand, Switzerland, and the UK. If we, since we all know how India has been contributing to these particular countries' shares of foreign trained doctors and nurses, we see that on the left hand side over here, what we have is the stock of India trained doctors. And these are the countries which have very high shares of India trained doctors. Similarly, on the right hand side of this right hand side panel, we have the stock of India trained nurses. Australia, Belgium, Canada, Italy, New Zealand, Norway, and UK have usually reported higher stocks of India trained nurses. Here I am representing the countries which have relatively lower stock of India trained doctors. Countries such as Germany, Israel, Ireland, or New Zealand for doctors, or Australia, Belgium, Canada for uh, nurses. Overall, we see that, of course, when we talk about uh, health worker migration, and ha as has already been pointed out during this panel discussion, we typically focus more on the doctors and the nurses. But if we try to look at the other occupational categories within healthcare, we do see that India holds a very important position. And this is as of 2016, we see that, be it in terms of the therapy and the assessment professionals or the medical technologists, India has held very high shares as well compared to the other country. Digging down deeper and just picking up one country in particular, say for example, Canada, and if I were to look at the last decade, 2010 to 2019, interestingly, I find that the data tells us that there has been a steady increase in the share of India trained physiotherapists employed in Canada over this last decade. So that is, of course, interesting because this is beside the increasing share that India trained doctors and nurses have been reporting in these countries. So there are possibilities, there is potential for the allied health professionals also to gain employment in these countries. But what really constrains us from understanding these trends and patterns is the fact that there isn't enough data. So I will briefly talk about that also. But before that, we are already aware of the common obstacles and how different uh, agreements, different multilateral instruments have been used to overcome such obstacles. Obstacles specifically for the healthcare domain have been in terms of uh, the credential recognition. And one very important is, of course, about the language skills, about the soft skills, because there the professionals have to deal with the patients and uh, that becomes a major issue, apart from, of course, uh, the utilization of their, uh, um, their skills. The bilateral agreements signed between Germany, China, New Zealand, Malaysia, Ghana, or Netherlands are some examples. And what might be interesting is to draw upon these agreements to find out what are the best practices which are going to be suitable, which are going to be appropriate, for signing agreements between India and the respective destination countries. So given all of that background, it is needless to say that the pandemic has had a major effect on the HRH. So as the uh, COVID-19 crisis unfolded, we saw that there have been large scale lockdowns. There have been several job losses in different sectors, but one of the sectors which has shown a steady increase in job postings has of course been in healthcare. A very interesting study by the OECD in 2020 clearly highlights the fact uh, as per certain specific OECD countries whereby there have been increase in the nursing assistance in the demand for general practitioners or registered nurses. Similarly, in the UK, several job postings for nursing assistants and so on. So what, re what is really the need of the hour is to have coherence between the policy on education, employment, as well as health system development. Because while we are catering to the global demand, we of course have to keep in mind our domestic demand as well. But what might be interesting is that in this process of augmenting the health capital or in augmenting uh, the capital that we have for health professionals, we might also be securing our own future, not just preparing for the global supply. India has, of course, not been lagging far behind. Uh, we have, of course, been taking several incentives. 
there have been standardization of the guidelines, the curricula. There has been a significant increase in the number of seats for medical and nursing education, relaxation of norms for enabling establishing institutes for medical and nursing education. Also, the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship has identified around three lakh jobs in health sector across certain developed countries and how we could probably be contributing to them. As the job requirements are not uniform, of course, there is more that needs to be done so that there could be more bilateral, more country to country or more G2G cooperation in terms of detailing out the skill requirements so that we can provide the necessary skilling uh, that's, that's going to be the appropriate way to go forward. The Ministry of Overseas Indian Affairs is also taking steps to build labor mobility partnerships with key destination countries. Uh, some recent developments have, of course, been with Japan, as we've also um, heard about during this panel discussion. But what is important is in terms of the bilateral agreements that India holds, in the majority of the cases, we do not really find a lot of discussion about health professional mobility. What we find is more about training and capacity building. What we find or we come across is more about how there could be more research and development um, uh, cooperations across countries and how India could be uh, actually contributing to that. So maybe keeping these things in mind would be more useful because then that is going to smoothen out the process and also give us some key points to look forward to so that we can have the policy formulations accordingly done. But the whole process will, of course, hinge upon the way we are reporting the data, the way the information systems are available, because that becomes very important to give us any idea about how we should go forward. And once we have that, we can, of course, look at the positive sides of how we can engage with the diaspora for uh, uh, for encouraging internships, for clinical placements, for scholarships, and also in the process contributing to our own health employment. So uh, because of the time limitation, so let me keep it short and say that this health worker migration issue is not an isolated issue, and it should be aligned with overall health system goals and broader policies which are, which are meant to address health system strengthening efforts should, of course, include health worker migration quite actively and given that a co collective action is going to be essential once the wave uh, once this pandemic gradually uh, dies down we will have more collaboration across countries so that we can actually contribute to the global supply of health professionals so let's view this current pandemic as a unique opportunity so that we can collectively invest and augment health employment not just domestically but globally as well so uh, that's it from my side thank you very much Ayana. Uh, so i know we, we have almost run out of time for the question answers or you know any comments from the audience but i would still like to take at least five minutes for that uh, so are there any questions at all uh, from the audience anyone who would like to make a comment My name is Praveena Mayai. I'm uh, yes, please. Kodos yes, from please. the Center for Development Studies in Trivandrum. Uh, so I just wanted to make a couple of quick points. One is that um, the entire discussion uh, seems to, or the focus of the discussion seems to have been on the OECD countries, uh, whereas the, des uh, the largest destinations of um, migrant nurses in particular, but also a lot of other health workers, if we were to actually think in terms of uh, nursing assistants and so on who go in the ECR category is the Middle East or, or the Arab countries. So uh, I, you know, I really don't know what sense to make of not that not having been brought into the picture because uh, as far as mobility from India goes, a lot of this is really driven by social networks because government came into the picture far more recently and therefore you know there's a need really for policy to also address the older ways in which um, uh, workers were moving and also address these destinations because there are a whole lot of issues with respect to these destinations so that's that's one uh, issue I just wanted to flag the fact that 
there are a lot of issues that nurses, nursing assistants, and so on face in the Middle East, and we really haven't brought that into the picture. The other issue that I do want to address, and that's come up in various ways in the presentations, is looking at um, uh, the nursing workforce or the health workforce in our country itself. And one of the big reasons for why there has been this huge expansion in nursing institutions is that uh, nurses want to go overseas and they really do not want to work within the country. And that has something to do with the system within the country where, of course, if you're in the public sector, that's fine. There's a day, the literature that shows that nurses working in the public sector would rarely migrate, where those in the private sector have extremely poor conditions of work. So I think there needs to be an equal emphasis on really looking at our system and ensuring that migration is a choice rather than something that you want to escape the country because the system is so bad. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kodos. I think those are extremely valuable points, especially I mean, one aspect that you mentioned, the geography part of it, which is the role of the GCC countries as a destination market and the kind of workers who go there, the issues of human rights, welfare conditions and so on, uh, which need particularly to be given attention when we're looking at that geography. Um, the other issue that you brought up, which is about you know, going out of the country as a choice. I think that's an extremely important point. And that comes back to what do we do domestically in terms of improving uh, our health systems, the career choices, our practices in uh, in the private sector, but I would even say in the government sector, because, uh, you know, in, in terms of the working conditions, and uh, this is known in the case of Africa as well, that a lot of this pushes people out of the country, the wages, the lack of career paths, uh, so the human resource management policies, and also I would say the issue of uh, reintegration and return, that's also not been touched upon so far, um, because if you're talking about win-win and trying to ensure there's enough capacity domestically also, and we are able to absorb back workers, will it a temporary mobility sort of arrangement? How do we reintegrate them? Do we take advantage of the new skill sets and you know the, the training that they might have got, gotten abroad so there are lots of other issues also to look at so thanks a lot for your comments uh, i'd like to call on uh, dr bhaskar um, he has posted a question in the chat uh, are there any recruiters of indian healthcare workers who can shed some light on how india can benefit from the global opportunities in the sector what steps should be taken by recruiters in India in this regard. So this comes back to an important issue, which is, you know, regulating the whole recruitment part and the intermediaries or the recruitment agencies. And if there are any recruitment agencies or anyone who can speak maybe from the panel uh, to shed some insights on this, on what could be done to manage the recruitment process better, make it more transparent. Thank you, Rupa, madam. Yeah. Would you like to articulate the question in a, or add anything to this? Uh, no, madam. I think uh, you have you have done it perfectly. Okay. So maybe I'll I'll just use my privilege as the moderator to call on Dr. Binod Khadria if, because I'm sure he would have. I would really like to hear his thoughts on on this question and also more generally. So uh, Rupa, I was. Uh, <clears throat> thinking that the time is running out and I was rather learning and, uh, you know, uh, listening uh, to all the presentations. They have been so complimentary. The five presentations were, you know, uh, giving uh, focus on different aspects. Uh, Rajiv Das Gupta, my colleague at JNU, uh, uh, well, I, uh, we have shared the same floor at uh, JNU School of Social Sciences. Uh, provided the both sides of the picture, the macro picture in terms of the supply and demand and the requirements that are there. And then we have heard the private sector also, the Apollo med skills, you know, what is at stake, how many nurses are being trained and exported and, and so on. So, and then we have heard the WHO, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, making us aware of the stakes that are there in terms of the um, health status of the people concerned on both sides, countries of origin and countries of destination, and how this is a highly inequitable situation in terms of the developed countries, which is already high in terms of health index and 
the poor countries or the developing countries which are uh, in, at the lower scale. And that is where I think conflict of interest uh, amongst the stakeholders is extremely important to be understood in terms of the time horizons. What is the time horizon that we are planning for? You know, whether it is capacity building, whether it is mobility, whether it is uh, training, whether it is placement, employment, and so on. So what is the objective uh, uh, of the stakeholders? And we have not talked about the migrant. We were talking about the origin countries, uh, India, what India can do. We have talked about OECD countries or destination countries, uh, including countries like Japan and so on. But we have not talked about the migrant. The migrant is not only the health worker, the doctor, the nurses, the allied workers, but their families, their children. What is at stake for them? Why are they migrating? I think I, I'm glad that CDS, uh, you know, uh, colleague had mentioned about why the, the, the nurses don't want to work within the country. I have myself been, uh, you know, undertaking surveys quite long time ago, and it was very difficult to get hold of the nurses speak to the, to the interviewer because they were overworked. So it was at the middle of the night that we had to talk to them, and they were so tired. And it was pathetic condition, working condition, so they want to get out. And many of the nurses want to get out because they want to promote the education of their children, not because they just want to have good working conditions. Doctors, for, I had done these uh, some studies for the OECD, and they are still available there on, the, on their website, uh, where Indian doctors uh, wanted to migrate not only for economic reasons, for the pay differences, but also for working conditions. So unless and until we think in those terms, then we may be, you know, being very myopic in mm -hmm. terms of just promoting employment and exporting our, uh, our, our highly skilled or potentially highly skilled manpower, which should determine the health status of the country. Now that I think is, is extremely important. It is not a question of only trade and employment. We would like to know how much the, you know, there were about six, I think, recruiters along with Apollo Med Skills at one point in time. I had written the India paper for uh, skill health, you know, for health skills journal. Uh, and that time there were six recruiters. One was Apollo, but Jaipur hospitals and so on were there. The question was, how much were the nurses paying for those training and placement and so on? Perhaps nothing. They were not paying anything. They were being recruited because there was much a larger amount of profits that were involved for the stakeholders. So what is it that the employers in the destination of country are paying for recruiting each nurse to the trainers in India? You know, and where are they coming from? How they are meeting those requirements, visa requirements and so on. So I think it's layers and layers of questions that need to be raised and addressed because we may be very wise in the short run, but in the long run, we may have, you know, given away a very vital resources that we need mm -hmm. for the raising the productivity of the country. Average productivity of labor in India is amongst the lowest in the world, which is a paradox. Our people working in United States, United Kingdom, developed countries, Australia, has the highest average per hour productivity. It's a model minority, they are called. Whereas in India, we are diluted by the low-skinned, average, uneducated, un unhealthy people who earn nothing. So I think that is, is, is a, a dilemma that needs to be addressed. And this is not easy to be uh, addressing that. We need to be innovative. It's a global shortage. Both the rich countries, uh, there is aging there. They need healthcare workers. And the our, our kind of society, which needs, because our already the WHO figures tell us how much in deficit we are. So we have to be innovative. And that innovative, I have written about it. Diaspora's role has been mentioned. So many medical professionals in diaspora are there. Should they be serving only the host countries or they can serving only the home countries? Because we have an obsession of the diaspora engagement with the home country only. Why not third countries? 
why not Ebola affected countries in Africa? Why not COVID affected countries in Southeast Asia and so on? Can there be a rotating? I have written about it. I have said we are talking about UN peacekeeping force. Why can't the WHO talk about UN healthkeeping force? And thereby the diaspora need not come home every vacation. They can spend one vacation doing grassroots level health, for, health service in a third country. So I think we have to think out of the box. There can be solutions, but it would depend on what we want. Do we want remittances only? <laughs> if we want to increase our remittances to what to get, to what purpose? So I think there are more questions than yeah, there are I, I answers to this. And thank you, you uh, Rupa, for, for asking me to speak. I didn't want to speak that long because time has run out. But it's very inspiring. No, I thought it was important because really this is a much, much more complex issue. It's about people moving, people to be treated as individuals with their own aspirations and their rights and so on. So there are, it cannot be just treated as a trade issue that I completely agree with. And it comes back to the need for doing a lot of supporting domestic reforms in the health system, in the way we manage our workers, how we motivate them, how we reintegrate them. Otherwise, no one will want to come back. So your win-win is not going to work unless we do our homework here. So there are many, many issues. I I, I would like to just ask, uh, give the last question here to Sita, but before that, uh, so Sita, I will come back to you, but just Apollo med skills, uh, if, uh, you know, if you could, just give a response to Bhaskar's question on this uh, recruitment. Whether there are steps that could be taken. Yeah, yeah I think very valid point uh, uh, mentioned uh, by uh, Mr. Binod and also alas, also answer uh, Mr. Bhaskar's question. Uh, yes, sir, I think uh, there are few countries which are focusing on reintegration. So the program that we do with UK is earn, learn, return. So um, they earn there, they learn, uh, they also come back with a degree, sp sub-specialization degree, either in critical care and cardiac care. And uh, we promise a job back in India with a salary matching with what they were drawing. That's the promise that we make with in the NHS contract. That's the reason we get these contracts from them because we are backed up by hospitals. That's easy for us. Uh, coming to other countries, yes, uh, uh, we do not have a, a written back integration contracts with any of these countries because those countries have not come up with some, especially Middle East and other countries. But generally, the visa validity will be ranging from uh, two to three years. So after that, it's the candidates uh, kind of it's the individual's choice whether they want to kind of continue with their visa in those countries or return. But UK is strictly a three-year visa extendable by another two years. Um, yes, so this is one. And uh, Bhaskar's question was, uh, are there any, can, uh, how India can benefit from the global opportunity? Yes, there are lots of opportunities. Yes, well, India has its own shortage of nurses and doctors, but I think this global mobility will also add a value back to India because we are giving an exposure to and international healthcare, one, they're going to learn some of the best practices in delivery. And India is also getting into a universal healthcare delivery. So there's a lot of learning that most of these healthcare resources do. So I want to say that out of close to 6,000 doctors working in Apollo, almost 2,800 of them are returned either from UK or US. So there is also a reverse brain drain happening at some point. People are returning, particularly the doctors. Is it happening with nurses? We do not have statistics, but uh, yes. And are they adding value to Indian healthcare? Certainly, uh, by uh, actually learning more procedures. I think they are, though India is one of the best medical training grounds, but I think they are getting a better exposure to technology and protocols and adding value. Uh, for the recruiters, what are the opportunities? Yes, the recruiters have to learn. There is a very little awareness about migration of international health workforce. Uh, there is a need for training sessions. I don't know which body in the government does that, but there's a need for training for all the healthcare recruiters because there are a lot of malpractices also happen in this area. That's what we have realized. They charge something from the nurses when they train them and well, they are fully funded by the recruitment countries. Like for example, NHS fully funds their training. So there's no need to charge anything for nurses. Uh, 
Uh, and what do they pay? Generally, the ongoing rate is 8.33%, which is equivalent to one month salary of uh, a nurse or a healthcare worker. So that is also there for the international recruitment. The, the regular HR practice that happens even in India, the same HR practice is there, uh, at least in our contracts. 8.33% um, is the recruitment fee. And there is no additional training fee that we get paid uh, by these uh, international recruiters. Thank you very much. Uh, so Sita, the last question, we are completely out of time. Thanks Rupa and um, thank you for this um, entire actually panel. It's been very informative and useful. I just want to point out one or two things. Um, just, you know, it cannot be treated like any other sector. And I think some people have said that this is different and we have to look at it differently. I'm all for migration, all for individual rights, but I think this one needs this is where multiple agencies need to come together, particularly the health sector needs to come in the conversation that we have on migration here. Um, and for that, I would, I mean, our experience has shown that employers do struggle, hospitals struggle in India. It would be worthwhile to bring them into that conversation also. It would be worthwhile to, for them to be in these conversations with us as well. Um, also with nurses and returning people, we found that uh, our studies have shown that they don't come back and join the workforce actually. Um, so we need to look at all those issues. The quality of work is just not of a standard that they want to come back and join the workforce. Some may teach, but very few. Um, so the point is, uh, you know, we really need to think more coherently and really bring more people together in these conversations. Talking of mobility of the workforce without the employers and perhaps without representatives of the workers themselves is probably not a good idea, particularly for the sector, I would say. So I'll be, and, and that's really what I want to put down. I think we have a lot of conversations, but we need to bring more people into the room. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I think a lot of points are coming, which are sort of resonating across all the panelists as well as the participants, which is this need for a multi sectoral, multi stakeholder, you know, sort of a much more coherent and an holistic way of approaching this and a lot more to be done at home. I think that's the main message that's coming to me from this discussion. I, I, I mean, I have very similar views about it. Having talked to nurses and all, it's impossible to think that they would want to come back. To that kind of work environment. Uh, so, anyways, thanks a lot. I, we don't have a, a time to go back to the panelists and uh, you know ask them for their final thoughts. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry about that, but I think we've had a pretty rich discussion. Um, unless uh, the panelists would like to say one last word or something, anything that comes to your mind, or otherwise, Surabhi, I'll hand it over to you. If anybody has any last thoughts, I can be just here and yeah, yeah. maybe just a, a one liner. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Dasgupta, Ayona, anyone would just like to make a final no, observation? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a great learning opportunity. Thank you. It was a great exposure, definitely. And as, uh, as was mentioned, it would be wonderful to actually have such multi stakeholders Colder meetings so that we also get to as academicians also we get more exposure we have of course for our papers we have surveyed people but uh, learning from such platforms would really help us also in the long run as well as help in policy formulations thank you thank you Surabhi. so thank you professor chanda for moderating this discussion and uh, to all the panelists who joined us today whenever we conceptualize a panel discussion it is our endeavor to bring in multiple stakeholders so that we hear views and maybe people can talk to each other because often we operate in our silos without knowing what the other one is doing so it's essential that uh, the academic community the recruiters and Others, um, the international organizations, we all sit together and actually brainstorm on new ideas. And as we saw today, we actually covered a lot of ground. We spoke about disparity in production, how there's a need for standardization of guidelines, the questions of equity, how a framework was needed for ethical recruitment, the importance to not just focus on allied workers, but uh, sorry, health workers, but also look at allied workers as well. And there's a need for investment within the country to actually bring the infrastructure to first meet domestic needs and then look at 
sending our people abroad. So I think this is a discussion which no matter how many times we discuss on this theme, every time we come up with new ideas. So that is the effort at our end to maybe have more discussions and generate new ideas, look at new research which is coming in this area. And at ICM, we'll continue to do that effort and make that endeavor. So thank you everyone who joined us today to the panel, to the participants. Thank you all. Uh, before we close, may I just request everyone for turning on their camera so that we take a virtual snap. And after that, we'll close. So I think we have a couple of pictures. Uh, thank you so much and have a pleasant evening ahead. ICM will keep sending out our invitations for monthly discussions to all of you. Thank you. We. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.